Hello, I'm Robert Prine, here with AmpThink to talk to you about a commercial DirecTV distribution system. We're going to run through all of the parts and pieces that allow you to take a signal from a satellite dish with DirecTV all the way out to IP multicast distribution. The stuff that you see before you today are all of the major components required to assemble one of these systems. We're going to start from the components closest to the satellite dish and work our way out into the venue. So to start with, on your dish itself, there is a component called an LNB. The LNB is the signal collector that receives the signal from all of the satellites and puts it on the RF wiring uh, to distribute out through your facility. Each one of those connections actually contains all of the signals from all of the carrier satellites. So first and foremost, you actually need to install a lightning arrestor. The device that you see here uh, prevents static electricity buildup and allows for the arresting of lightning in the event that a strike occurs on your satellite dish. Uh, the one that I have in front of me is a four channel, but uh, typically we use all of the six inputs on a modern reverse band LNB. So you'd need either two of these uh, four way arresters or you'd need one four and one two. After your lightning arresting, the first thing you need to do is make sure that you have isolated the specific polarities and transponders that you're going to distribute through the rest of your facility. Uh, this could be accomplished with uh, a SWIM if you were talking about a, a residential uh, system as opposed to a commercial system. But because we're actually going to be sending to a variety of SWIMs and a variety of tuners, we do our polarity locking upstream. So directly off of the satellite, we take this device. It's referred to as a polarity locker, and it does essentially what you would think it does. Each one of these inputs takes in the signal from the LNB. That LNB contains all of the carrier signals and then isolates one specific uh, transponder and polarity and passes it through to the according output. The other nice thing about a polarity locker is that the polarity locker actually allows you to insert power to the LNB on the satellite dish. Um, this device would connect to a 29 volt power inserter. That's this device that you see here that provides all the power necessary to run your LNB as well as the polarity locker. After your polarity locker is powered, your LNB is powered, and we've isolated individual polarities and transponder signals, the next piece is transport. We have to find a way to transport each of those individual transponders without a great deal of signal loss. Typically, we do this in commercial environments using a media converter. Uh, in this case, we have a Foxconn unit that takes in all six of our LNB inputs out of the polarity locker and actually allows us to transmit all of those signals over a single strand of fiber. Now, one thing to note, once you've polarity locked your signal, every single cable is directly wired as a one-to-one -one basis into each step in your distribution chain. So you'll note output one, will match out input one on your uh, transmit. The same thing will apply on the receiver, into your trunk amplifier, and all the way down until we actually get into our swims. Um, on the receiving side, again, almost identical to the transmitter, this device has six outputs. And because it's independently powered from the inputs coming off of the LNB, uh, because it has its own power supply, we expect that the output signal strength from the output on the media converter is going to be exactly the same as it was on the input side. Uh, one of the important things we have to look at in the satellite distribution system is being sure that our input and output voltages are appropriate for each of the individual components in the system that we're setting up. Uh, in fact, many of the components that we're going to look at today are built around stepping down the voltage to make sure that we've reached the appropriate um, uh, gain for that specific step. Uh, one of the big reasons we have to be careful about gain is when we're using long distance runs over fiber as opposed to using traditional coaxial cable, there's no uh, attenuation of signal along those long cable runs. An important note for everyone out there, typically 100 feet of coaxial cable equates to about a seven decibel drop. Uh, and so some of what we're going to do here is trying to emulate the drop that we would see over typical long coaxial runs. Now. After we complete our media conversion coming from LNB into our fiber transmitter, into our receiver, 
The next thing we have to do is make sure that all of the outputs are normalized. Now, there may be some variation because of uh, the specific uh, location of your dish relative to the satellite receivers. There may be some differences in the gain level that you see on an individual transponder's output, uh, but that can be corrected for using a device called a trunk amplifier. That's what you see here. Now, a trunk amplifier's job essentially is to normalize the output for all six of the transponder signals that you receive in your system. Uh, they're very easy to operate. You'll note that there is a general slope adjust. This is for all of the inputs to the system as a whole, and then individual potentiometers that allow you to attenuate the signal uh, or amplify the signal for each of those uh, transponder and polarities. Uh, we are actually aiming for uh, approximately minus 20 dB coming off of the satellite dish. So if you're uh, actually using a meter, for example, a direct TVA meter or something similar that can measure an LNV input, a device like this would allow you to look at the signal coming out of your trunk amplifier and confirm what the actual gain is directly off of the amplifier. The same thing could apply for confirming that the outputs are healthy coming off of a polarity locker or confirming that you're actually getting signal at the far end of your media converters. Now, again, everything is direct one-to-one. -one. So your input one from the polarity locker comes into the media converter into the input one on your trunk amplifier. It's very important to keep each of these uh, individual transponder signals correct throughout your uh, signal chain because when you get to the swim, the thing that actually lets you lock tuners and, and actually tune channels, uh, if you have those transponders out of order, those swims will not be able to appropriately pull their content. Now, uh, after you've made sure that your gain is leveled across all of your LNB inputs, the next thing we need to do is a little bit more attenuation. Uh, the minus 20 dB signal is a little bit too hot for uh, our next step in distribution, which are your swims or single wire multi-switches. So in order to attenuate that signal somewhat, we have something called a trunk tap. Now, in this case, it's a 6 dB trunk tap, which means that every input into this device is going to be brought down uh, minus 6 dB. So let's say that we're coming out of our trunk amplifier at minus 20. Out of the trunk tap, that'll take us down to minus 26. An important note about the trunk tap specifically, there are actually three ports for every signal. There's an input port, a tap port, and an out port. The input port is coming in off of your uh, media transmission, but uh, if you wanted to just pass through uh, and not deal with any attenuation, you can do that with the output port. It'll just pass the signal straight through with no attenuation. But typically, if we're putting these in an architecture, we want to use our tap port because that's what actually gets us that drop of six decibel. Um, now, the other thing to note about these pieces of equipment, much like the polarity locker that takes in our 29 volt power, uh, the same thing applies for your trunk amplifier. A single 29 volt power supply will also power the trunk amplifier, and that power will pass through the, through the taps and most of your other distribution equipment. Now, depending on the system that you're architecting and how many tuners you're actually building out for, you may need more than a single set of transponder inputs. Now to do that, you would use a DirecTV rated four-way splitter, something just like this. You would use one splitter per transponder or polarity, and then split it out as a number of separate inputs, depending on the number of uh, COM cards that you're expecting to land on, or if you're distributing directly to set-top boxes. It's based entirely on the number of swims that you'll design into your system. Um, in this case, the layout that we're looking at is specific to a single swim, uh, but you'll see how that can be expanded as we continue talking through the distribution. An important note about a four-way splitter is that you typically have somewhere between 5 and 10 dB of loss, depending on how many devices are actually connected into that splitter. Uh, we typically calculate it an average of minus 7 dB. Uh, and what's really important here is this is typically the last step in attenuation prior to going into your single wire multi-switch. Now, uh, the single wire multi-switch itself, it has an ideal operating range of between minus 30 and minus 50 decibels. Uh, so let's talk through each of our gain steps attenuating from the media converter into the swim. Coming off of the dish, expecting approximately minus 20 dB, uh, 
we've confirmed that we've set and normalized all of the output gains from the trunk amplifier to approximately 20 dB into the trunk tap. We attenuate approximately minus 6, which gets us to minus 26 dB. And then if we split with minus 7, we've gone from minus 26 to minus 33. Minus 33 puts us in the expected operating range for our single wire multi switches. Now, this is really the heart and brain of most of a, a direct TV system. This is a direct TV D SWIM 30. Again, a SWIM stands for single wire multi switch. And this device is what's capable of tuning individual direct TV channels, as well as pulling the channel guide information uh, that is needed by a variety of tuners. Now, each one of these uh, SWIMs actually requires an input from each of our transponders through our distribution system. So you can run uh, a SWIM by itself just like this, with its own dedicated 29 volt power supply and the inputs from each of your uh, trunk tap. However, you can also take a number of cards and aggregate them together in a device called a SWIM expander. The device that you see in front of you here is a DirecTV SWIM expander. This is designed to take four total D-SWIM 30s, which is enough to fully populate a four-card COM3000 system. Now you'll note the chassis to my right has four COM51 cards occupying four of its slots. These cards can each tune up to 23 channels. In, in order to do so, they need to take both of the outputs from this DSWIM 30. These are very simple to set up. You can confirm from the bottom the individual polarities that were tuned in our polarity locker are printed on the SWIM itself. They are also printed on the SWIM expander card. So I've actually removed the weatherproof nubs in this case uh, because typically when we're mounting our SWIMs for commercial systems, they're in weatherproof enclosures uh, in data centers and racks. Uh, not nearly as much of a concern as it would be if this SWIM had to live somewhere outside, for example. So you'll note that the slot lines up quite easily. There is a post on the right-hand side here that lines up with a post on the swim itself. And all we have to do is insert the swim, press it firmly, and these tabs lock it in place. Now, once the tabs are locked in place, this can be connected up to the rest of your system. The same way that I mentioned earlier, like on the swim, where the individual polarities are written on the swim. They're also written on the swim expander. Let's see if we can get a good shot right there. So now that we have the card in, all we have to do is extend our hopefully post split LNB outputs by polarity in the same order that we have them locked. One, two, three, four, five and six. Now that takes care of getting your signal into your swim expander, but you do still need power. So if you'll note, the front of your swim expander shows uh, six different inputs for power. In fact, the two in the center, one and two, both take inputs from the same 29 volt swim power module. From the input module, we then need to send out one of these cables for each of our individual swims. So we would remove the power nub that you see here and then run a coaxial cable from the matching power connector directly into the swim. Once the swim expander is powered and all of the LMB inputs are passed into the swim expander and we've powered this swim, we're ready to send this on to the comm system. Now, we mentioned before that all of these devices are, are a little bit sensitive to what the input levels are. Uh, so we actually do need to attenuate on the output of the swim before we come into the comm system. Now, much like we did a tap for all of the trunk outputs, we can also tap the individual swim outputs. This device that you see here is referred to as a dray tap. 
And in this case, this is a minus 9 dB Dray tap, which will take us down uh, from minus 34 to minus 44. Math. <laughs> Uh, that puts us in the appropriate operating range for the inputs on the comm system. Now, you'll note on your D-SWIM, you have two SWIM outputs. You'll notice that on each COM51 card, there are two SWIM inputs. In order to support the full 23 channels that you can license for each COM51 card, both of the inputs on the SWIM have to go into the COM51 card. So we've fully attenuated, we've stepped down our voltage from our swim outputs, we've come into the comm system, and the comm system, which we'll cover in a separate training, specifically allows us to take and tune as many as 23 channels total on a single COM51 card and output them as multicast MPEG TS streams. Thank you guys, hope that you learned something, and uh, we'll be here again. Cheers. <laughs>